y'all. It's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. Today we're going to explore one of my favorite subjects, the history of New Orleans music. I'm going to show you that via Armstrong Park, right outside of the French Quarter, Preservation Hall, one of our most famous music venues, and a little bit of Frenchman Street, one of the spots where you can find live local music today. Our first stop, Armstrong Park, is at an intersection of some of the key cultures that make New Orleans what it is. Jazz is fusion music, New Orleans is a fusion culture, and you can see most of the major ingredients right here. This side of the street is the French Quarter. So over there we have the oldest neighborhood in New Orleans, which is originally founded by the French, eventually run by the Spanish. It's the home of the city's Latin culture. And over there you can see the steeple of St. Louis Cathedral over in Jackson Square. But just outside the quarter, over in this direction, you can see some skyscrapers, and that's gonna be where English-speaking Anglo-Americans from further north in the United States came to when Louisiana was bought by the United States in 1803. And then you have the Treme neighborhood, which is what we're in right now. Armstrong Park is the nearest part of the Treme to the French Quarter, and this is the neighborhood where the city's West African influence mostly lives. Western Africa is where enslaved people were kidnapped from and brought to New Orleans, and for a few reasons they had a little bit more room to leave a cultural mark in this city than in the rest of the country. Armstrong Park is both a historic site having to do with that history, and it's full of monuments that are gonna connect that story with the story of jazz music's creation. If you ever do visit Armstrong Park, the part you can really recognize is the gate, showing you the name. And it's pretty obvious who this is named for. Louis Armstrong is the most famous New Orleanian of any kind. And his connection with the park is a little bit loose. He probably never set foot on the ground that it contains today, but he's the perfect mascot for New Orleans in a few different ways. A lot of people born in New Orleans, they're gonna start pretty low on the ladder as far as possible American lives go. And to become somebody world famous from that kind of origin, it takes a mixture of grit and luck to make that happen. Lewis had a lot of both of those things, and we'll hear more about him later on, but there's a little detail of his early life that I think just tells the whole story. And it's the first time Lewis ever got his name in the newspaper. He was 11 years old, and he was in the newspaper for being arrested. New Year's Eve, he was enjoying a street party in his neighborhood called Storyville, and he got excited enough that he went inside of his house, found his dad's gun, brought it out in the street, and fired six blanks in the air. Totally harmless, but the police arrested him, and they sent him to kind of a military-style juvenile detention which is mostly not a place where happy stories are going to begin. In his case, though, he happens to be there while there's this great music educator working there, and that guy ends up giving him the only 18 months of formal music training that he ever gets in his life, such that by the time he gets out of that juvenile detention, he has gotten his name in the newspaper for the second time, this time as the band leader for the house marching band. So there was the luck of being there at the right time, there was the grit of being able to last through it, and there was putting the work behind his talent that made him able to take advantage of that education and make himself better. So given Lewis's early work as a musician, it's only appropriate that one of the first things you see when you come inside the park is a monument to one of our classic brass bands. If you come visit here, you could take a picture sticking your face to the drum, you could jump up here and pretend to be playing another musical instrument. No one's ever thought to do those things before. But it would be appropriate to get pictures with living people in connection with this band because this is what we call a second line band. And second lines not just consist of a band, but also a big crowd of people walking behind them. And you can definitely see this if you visit the French Quarter nowadays. They happen for all kinds of different reasons. A second line can be commemorating any kind of big occasion. Oftentimes if you see them in the quarter today, they're celebrating a wedding. And a lot of times that's folks from out of town. But if you went back into the early 20th century, the era when jazz was brand new, what you'd be seeing is them leading the way for a funeral. And back even further, in the later part of the 19th century, years following the American Civil War, you might see a band like this being followed by a group of African-descended Civil War veterans, people who had fought in that war and now were marching in protest, demanding voting rights in the new constitution the state was going to be writing after the war. So, very different purposes, definitely weddings, funerals, protests are all things you might find them doing today. The music has been really different throughout all this time too. So where today you're gonna hear kind of a funk, hip hop, R&B flavored sound from these bands most of the time. Traditional jazz is also their sound today and especially back early in their relatively early days. 
And then back in the 19th century, they were going to be playing military music, which was really popular music in that time frame. Simple march music, real clear, heavy beat, a sound that was meant to get everybody following the band walking on the same rhythm. So part of our European musical heritage, but we also have a West African musical heritage, and that lives within this park over in what we call Congo Square. Congo Square, y'all, isn't much to look at. It's a pretty simple space, and it would have been even simpler in its heyday. Right now, we're just outside the French Quarter, which was the original city. So along the edge of the park, there was a wall. That's why this is called Rampart Street today. And this would have been the edge of the woods, an open space right next to the swamps that fell outside of town. So this was the space where enslaved people would spend their day off. This is one of the big differences between New Orleans and most of the rest of the country, is that enslaved people had, a, in theory at least, a day free here every week. And the fact that it was Sunday gives you a hint how this comes about. So when France founds this area and when Spain takes it over, they both have a state religion, Catholicism, which has a lot of say in the laws of their colonies. And one thing they require is that enslaved people be forcibly baptized when they're brought here. And also that they be allowed to observe the day of rest at the end of the week. So. A Sunday off, you can imagine, not perfectly enforced, but it did lead to a culture of enslaved people having some free time, and this is where a lot of them would have spent it. So there would have been a marketplace element about this, but you also would have seen huge gatherings of people drumming and dancing. The drums would have been the djembe, oftentimes a huge West African drum, and also you would have had singers doing call and response chants. And there was a religious intent behind these gatherings, something that an onlooker of that time who wasn't part of the tradition wouldn't have understood. That's the roots of the voodoo religion here, which is a religion from Western Africa that survives here under really heavy camouflage. But even they, even the bystanders, would have been able to appreciate the music they were hearing and that it was a really different thing from what they were used to. West African music is more improvisational, it's polyrhythmic, there's different beats stacked on top of each other. It was as different as could be from the European music that you would have heard here. And that would have included not just the military marches that I mentioned, but also just a few blocks away, there was an opera house. So a person living in New Orleans in the right area at the right time could have heard West African drumming and opera almost on the same day. And that combination was gonna mean inevitably people were gonna start mixing those things up. Leaving Congo Square and exploring more of the park, y'all, we actually have a monument to the opera house that used to stand on Bourbon Street. This opera house and other places like it generally would have had integrated seating in the way that we think about it now. Segregation laws by race weren't a common thing in New Orleans pre-Civil War. You would have had divisions by bond status. Were you enslaved or were you free? And a lot of places that would have been the same thing for all practical purposes as race. But here, for a lot of reasons, you had a class of what was called free people of color. And these were folks who were partly or fully African descended, probably descended from enslaved people, but themselves free, even while slavery was still in practice. And so, if you were enslaved, you sat in one area of the theater, and if you were free, you sat in the other area, only divided by what kind of ticket you could afford. So it was totally conceivable that in a certain era in New Orleans, an enslaved person might have been walking home in the evening, whistling an operatic melody, but putting their own rhythmic twist on it. We don't know what that sounded like, because those things were never recorded or written down, but we do know what the opposite sounded like. Sometimes you had European extracted people who heard the West African style music and put their own twist on it. A good example would be Louis Moreau Gottschalk, a composer who was born right across the street from Congo Square in 1829. English German Jewish dad, Haitian Creole mom, lived right across the street from Congo Square and heard the drumming every Sunday, piano prodigy, playing concerts as early as the age of seven. And so when he goes on to be an adult composer, he writes stuff on the one hand that sounds kind of like Chopin, but he also takes West African dances and puts them on the piano. And this stuff had a fan base, but it also met with a pretty violent reaction sometimes. He took his music to Boston once, and there was a critic there who panned his show by saying that the music was too eccentric, too American. Definitely suggests an idea that there's like run right way to do music, but if you're somebody who likes a musician to sound like they know where they come from, this might be something you'd really dig. And there definitely was an audience for it and later on for another version of that idea, which was jazz music. Jazz comes about not just because of the mixing together of opera, marches that we talked about, West African drumming, 
but also other things that came around here after the Civil War, other European-African fusions. Enslaved people moving from plantations to the city brought their music with them, blues music, which is probably a fusion of European and West African folk music. And right at the turn into the 20th century, nationwide popular music was ragtime, which was music for the piano, named for the idea of ragged time, that it was on these West African extracted syncopated beats. It accented beats that felt wrong to the European ear. And so you get all these different fusions in the air. And if you were an adventurer, you could go around and hear all of those things. 1880 was around the time when the traditions in Congo Square died out, although nowadays you can visit and you can see drummers live there. That tradition has revived, but that falls within the early lifetime of some early jazz musicians. Even if someone like Buddy Bolden, who we call the first jazz band leader, never heard the drumming in Congo Square themselves, they very likely heard about it from parents, from grandparents, and maybe had those rhythms in their fingers still. So this guy would have been an adventurer who went across boundaries, went through different neighborhoods, heard different kinds of music. And when he was around, there wasn't a huge demand for jazz because it barely existed yet. He would have just as likely played a waltz if you hired him to do that as anything else. But he was fiddling with the lineup, fiddling with who was in his band, what they sounded like, the beats they played on. And they ended up doing these kind of bluesy, ragtimey remixes of pieces that they'd written as well as really well-known stuff from the time and ended up with some of the first things you could call jazz. I wish I could tell you more about it. We actually don't know very much about what it sounds like. There's no known recordings of this man and only a couple of photos. So the record of his life is pretty scarce. Partly that's because his career didn't last very long. In 1908, he's a pretty young man. He's born in 1877. In 1908, he starts to have these violent episodes against members of his family. The best guess in retrospect is that he was developing something like schizophrenia. And so that year, he is sent to a mental institution and lives there for the rest of his life until he dies in 1931. 1933 is when you get early jazz scholars coming to New Orleans and starting to ask questions from these early musicians doing interviews with them. They never ended up speaking with him, but his compatriots all had a lot of stories to tell about him. And one picture you get, he played at a place called the Eagle Saloon, and he was known for the signature move that he did there. So right when his set was gonna begin, he would blow out the window, loud as could be, little serenade into the street that apparently could be heard for blocks, and would turn heads all over the place and get people curious, what else can this guy do? Would draw in an audience for his show. And a couple blocks away, according to his own storytelling, a young Louis Armstrong, five and six years old, is living at the time, hearing that sound, and it helps him decide, this is what I want to do. So the first generation speaking to and setting up the second generation, even without actually knowing it. There was recently, back in 2019, a really bold attempt at telling this man's story. It's inevitably historical fiction because we know so little, but there's a movie called Bolden, which had a lot of help musically and production-wise from Wynton Marsalis, one of the great New Orleans-born jazz musicians. You can get him playing the best guess at what this early stuff sounded like. Definitely worth checking out. Not a PG-rated film, so decide carefully who you watch that with. So, Lewis had the plan to become a musician from five or six years old. He starts to make good on that plan by the time he's seven. When Lewis is seven years old, he gets his first job and his first musical instrument. He's hired by this family of Lithuanians. So Storyville, his neighborhood, was full of immigrants from a lot of different places. He talked about how good the Chinese food was there. And this Lithuanian family was running a business that was basically them finding useful junk and selling it from a cart that they pushed through the neighborhood. So Lewis was hired to do a lot of things. One of his jobs was he had a tin horn, and as they did their route, he'd sit on the front of the cart and he'd blow on this horn to tell the block that they were coming, tell everyone to come out and get their stuff. So he's making noise at that point, more so than music. But one day while he's with them, they go by the secondhand store and they end up spotting a used cornet in the window, the instrument that was the lead instrument for most jazz bands at the time. He decides he wants it and he asks his employers to front him a couple of weeks pay so he can afford to buy it. So if in the first place you can imagine hiring a seven-year-old, then imagine that seven-year-old negotiating with you. That's the kind of kid this was and he ends up getting a yes. So he has his first instrument in his hands. He's still playing it once he gets out of juvenile detention. And when he is on the street as a street musician, starting to make his living, 
he's tap dancing, he's singing, he's playing that cornet. And he's in a neighborhood where there's a lot of older kids than him who might take his money. So he has a trick that he does, and it earns him a nickname. So rest of his life, a lot of people call him Satchmo. And according to him, that comes from this time frame when he was performing on the street, rather than have like a cigar box in front of him that people could throw change into, every time someone threw him a coin, he'd pick it up and stick it in his mouth. And that would have kept it out of sight, also would have gotten him an incredible immune system, really strong cheek muscles. If you're going to tour the world as a brass player, it's good cross training. And he got the nickname Satchel Mouth, which is like wallet face. And apparently saying that through a mouthful of nickels, it sounded like Satchmo stuck for life. So he gets his nickname then. He also starts to meet his lifelong associates then. A lot of the older jazz musicians notice him and they start to bring him in off the street to play their gigs. And he starts to work his way towards being the guy you see here from being this kid on a street corner. This shows him really at the peak of his career. It takes a while and it's a few different steps to get there. He's rising up through the ranks of New Orleans jazz musicians just as a lot of them are leaving the city. So the era of his adolescence, the 1910s, is part of the Great Migration, the era when lots of black Southerners were leaving the South, just like their ancestors a few generations before had left the plantations where they'd spent their lives in order to come to the city and look for opportunity here. Their descendants had realized that that had not worked out, and so they were going for cities much further afield. Chicago was a really big one, and Lewis ends up moving to Chicago. When he's there, he's joining a band as the second cornet player. Not a glamorous job, but he ends up meeting his second wife in that band. She plays the piano. Her name is Lil Hardin. She plays a big role in encouraging him to become the person that you see here. She coaches him on appearances, gets him looking sharp like this. She encourages him to perform in New York, which is where some of the biggest career successes he has end up happening. And she also, with him, form their own band. And they end up making recordings where you can hear him experimenting, stepping away from the ensemble sound of traditional jazz and starting to step out as a soloist a lot more. And that's really what people tend to think of as the default jazz sound today. So all of these different musicians going to different cities, each putting their own spin on it in the new places they went, is partly why there's so many different genres of jazz today. Each place took on its own twists, more and more of them over time. There's, from there, really it's his professional story. It's the better known part of his life. And there's way too many stories for us to tell. But one little detail about him and Lil Hardin. They don't stay married. He's married four times in the course of his life, but they do stay close. And she's one of the people, when he dies in 1971, who's asked to perform at Lewis's memorial ceremony. She does, and she is at the piano mid-song when she has the heart attack that ends her life. So their lives and even their deaths stay intertwined to an almost unimaginable degree. We've stepped outside of the park now, but one last thought about the things we talked about in there. The park is a commemorative site more than it is a historic site. Congo Square is here, but most of the things we talked about happened on the street that divides the Treme from the French Quarter called Rampart Street. It's right next to us now. So Louis Moreau Gottschalk, the composer, lived right across the street. Further up is where Buddy Bolden played. It's where Louis Armstrong had a lot of his early career. And on this street too, one more thing to add that you haven't heard about yet is we have a little bit down the way, the former home of a recording studio, which is where in the 40s, long after Louis Armstrong had left town, you get this place set up that starts to record musicians in new local styles. In 1949, this bar pianist from the Lower Ninth Ward that no one had heard of named Fats Domino ends up making his first recordings there on this low-grade garage band setup. And one of those songs ends up being the first million seller in the rock and roll or rhythm and blues category. That stuff catches fire all over the country and really spreads through American culture all over the world. And you end up getting imitators, Elvis to the Beatles and lots and lots of other folks besides. And really knowing the things that have happened on this street, you could take almost any contemporary musical artist and do a six degrees of separation that would find them right back on these 10 or 12 blocks of Rampart Street. So it's an insanely important historical corridor. The reason why we didn't spend more time on it is because most of these things are gone. Louis Moreau Gottschalk's home isn't there anymore. The Eagle Saloon is an empty shell, and this building is now a laundromat. But in this case, time has reversed a little bit. The owners of the laundromat have actually turned it into a little bit of a laundromat slash museum, first of those in the world as far as I'm aware. So if you happen to be in the French Quarter, need to get some laundry done, that's a place where you can see some of this musical history 
in the midst of a place that has changed quite a lot. Next up, y'all, we're gonna step inside of the French Quarter and pay a visit to Preservation Hall, one of the most important music venues in the country or anywhere, and it's gonna be right next to our famous Bourbon Street. Let's do it. Y'all, this dingy little what even color is it building is the home of Preservation Hall. It's super easy to miss, especially with Bourbon Street right around the corner. A lot of people come here expecting this place to look more like Lincoln Center or something more high end. And that's the association that a lot of other genres of jazz have come to have. But traditional jazz, the original genre from New Orleans, is right at home in tumble down little venues like this place. Preservation Hall wasn't actually a jazz venue in the early days of the genre. And really the French Quarter in general wasn't really the home to jazz in its early days. It becomes that in large part thanks to World War II. Bourbon Street right over here was a relatively quiet local bar corridor at that time. And then about a third of the US military poured through the city during the war. It's one of the reasons we have the World War II Museum located here. So you end up with lots of young men about to ship out on leave from a base having some leisure time in one of these local bars, hearing a jazz sound and getting attached to it for the rest of their lives, such that after the fact, you get this massive demand for this as a tourist destination and the number of bars gradually grows and grows until you get the strip that we know today. But as you get into the 1950s, the attention shifts from jazz gradually over to rock and roll as more the sound that people are expecting. And the, and the street has always shifted with what commerce really wanted. So. Jazz artists are less and less employable over there, and eventually you get an art gallery in this building starting to host small jazz shows just to draw attention to the work. By 1961, this place was known as one of the places to go for jazz, where it was about the music. They didn't sell drinks, they didn't sell food, and they still don't to this day. So the place switched over to being a pure music venue, and it remains that now. It's still just as small, and so getting a ticket here can be pretty competitive because it is so famous. And unlike an early jazz venue, it's not a place where you'd go to dance these days. It's way too crowded for that. But if you want to get about as close as you can get to the experience of historical jazz from the point of view of the artist, being up close with them is an ideal way to step back in time. The advanced tickets you can get here would get you a seat right up at the front. You can feel the improvisation. You can see all that physical energy that would have been part of these shows at one time, and that's pretty hard to beat but there's a bunch of other places in and near the French Quarter where you can get something like a traditional jazz show, the other genres we're known for, blues, funk, brass bands, all that stuff. And our last stop is gonna be one of the best places for that in town. Last stop, y'all. We're on Frenchman Street, right outside of the French Quarter. A lot of people in New Orleans would tell you this is the main place for live local music today. And it just kind of hit that status not too long ago in the years around Hurricane Katrina. You can imagine in that time with that big disaster going on, we were just as concerned for the future of New Orleans' soul as its body. There was a lot of questions about will musicians be able to make a living in this city anymore? They were never totally dependent on visitors, but there were no visitors and way fewer residents during that time. So it was an open question. And for a lot of reasons, it ended up working out. Not only did musicians get a lot of help around the era of Katrina, finding housing again, getting any instruments that might have been destroyed by flood water replaced, but also we found ourselves in the spotlight in a way we really hadn't expected to be. Hollywood was a big part of that, but also a lot of folks who came and visited us to be part of a service project, one of these many recovery efforts sometimes became regular visitors, sometimes even moved here. So in a lot of ways after Katrina, we had more musicians living here and we also had more attention on the music here, which you can see in, for example, HBO's Treme TV show that was produced about musicians after Hurricane Katrina. And so we ended up with a lot of people coming and visiting this street that before Katrina had largely been a pretty well-kept local secret. And nowadays it's in this kind of strange place where it's only two blocks, it fills up really fast, and as more and more people have heard about it, as it becomes more and more Googleable, definitely you get nowadays, especially on a Friday or a Saturday night, a lot of bachelor and bachelorette parties up and down the street in a way that feels a lot more like how we think of Bourbon Street. So we've been wondering for a while, those of us who live here, definitely appreciating that there's a lot of attention on our musicians, but also wondering, is there much of a place for us here anymore? 
And then, of course, you get the pandemic that comes along and means that these places are shuttered completely for a little while. So we're in kind of that post-Katrina mindset again as far as where is this going to go? What's it going to look like if it does come back? As far as catching live music right now, though, things are a bit different from after Katrina because a lot of musicians are doing live streams, they're recording, and so you can catch them, just not in a live setting just yet. And to find some of that stuff, one of your best bets is to look into our local radio station, which is WWOZ. In the area, it's 90.7 FM. If you want to find them from somewhere else, you can find them on their website, which is WWOZ.org. And that's going to give you access to streaming their radio station 24-7, 365, local music, great world music, all the time. And they will also provide you via their website great information about shows going on for right now, digital ones, and eventually when live music is a thing again, the live ones as well. So check that out. You'll be happy you did. We'll be happy you did as well. And thank you for listening in on this too. Have a good one.